Man, what happened to Gem Knights? What started off as a really cool attempt to adapt and modernize the playstyle elemental heroes were known for in the anime, with their whole varied fusion mishmash and beatdown focus, eventually turned into FTK City as the only viable way to play the deck, and their best fusion spell ended up being a better play enabler for 12 dozen other decks than for Gem Knights themselves. It's gotten to the point where it's not really worth talking about the cards that don't inherently support the FTK, due to every other playstyle the archetype is known for being horrifically outdated, but in my best attempt to summarize everything relevant about this deck's history, I'll attempt going over all these cards as thoroughly as they deserve. As one would expect from an archetype taking heavy inspiration from the early elemental heroes, there's a sizable chunk of normal monsters here. Gemnite Lapis, a level 3 rock with 1200 attack and 100 defense. Gemnite Sapphire, a level 4 aqua with 0 attack and 2100 defense. Gemnite Tourmaline, a thunder type with 1600 attack and 1800 defense. Gemnite Garnet, a pyro type with 1900 attack and 0 defense. And Gemnite Crystal, a level 7 rock with 2450 attack and 1950 defense. To people unaware of the deck's playstyle and general presence in the game, I imagine all these seem fairly unassuming, which to be fair is the case with Sapphire and Crystal. Sapphire is an outdated wall that gives you access to some of the worst fusions in the archetype, and Crystal, being a Neos reference, is about as useful as Neos would be to a general elemental hero deck, meaning not in the slightest. Lapis, on the other hand, is basically a 3 off due to the FTK variant requiring a fusion monster that uses her as material, so don't be fooled by the cutesy appearance for a minute. Thermaline gives you access to some pretty good fusions and has tolerable attack for a level 4, which is enough utility to be ready and a 2 or 3 in the deck. Garnet is the town bicycle, everybody got around on this thing. For those unfamiliar why, we'll get into it later, but looking at it in the vacuum of the archetype, it's a good level 4 beater and lets you play some decent fusions. It feels so weird describing Garnet like that. Now for the Pringles. Gem Knight Lazuli is their only level 1, and it's a rock type with 600 attack and 100 defense. If this card is sent to the graveyard by a card effect, you can target one normal monster in your graveyard, add that target to your hand. As you may imagine, in a deck focusing on fusions and running a fair number of normal monsters, this is a pretty solid card. She can serve as combo extension, recovery, or increasing damage on board if you haven't used up your normal summon. It's an easy 3 off. Next up is their only level 2 monster, Crystal Rose. It's a light attribute, has 500 attack and defense, and the following effect. Once per turn, you can send one Gem Knight or Melodious monster from your hand or deck to the graveyard, and if you do, this card's name becomes the sent monsters until the end phase. If this card is in your graveyard, you can banish one fusion monster from your graveyard, special summon this card in defense position. You can only use this effect of Crystal Rose once per turn. The Melodious inclusion in this card's effect is a reference to this cute little character moment from early arc 5, which only serves to remind me that this series was somehow sabotaged by humanoid iguanas from the underworld halfway through. Anyway, the card itself is pretty good, probably feels much more at home with Gemnites than it does with Melodious. The first effect can set up the graveyard, trigger Lazuli's floating, and as was probably intended, serve as quick access to specific fusion materials. The second effect doesn't seem amazing at first, but it has great synergy with some of their other cards. Also, it's basically their only light monster, which is relevant for one of their best fusions. Run any number of these. Now, going from Diamond in the Rough to just rough, we have Gem Elephant. It's a level 3 with 400 attack and 1900 defense, and during your main phase, you can return this face-up card from the field to the hand. During damage calculation, if this card attacked or was attacked, you can send one normal monster from your hand to the graveyard, this card gains 1000 defense. Dumbo's career as a drag queen was brought to a tragic end as he ended up being one of the worst support cards of all time. At the cost of a valuable normal monster you could've used for fusion, someone that can actually affect the game state, you get... Big Shield Gardener. I also have no idea what in high heaven the purpose of the self-bounce effect is supposed to be, but I like it on the basis of never wanting to see this on the field in my life. Moving on. Their next level 3 is Gem Merchant, a spellcaster with 1000 attack and defense, and during the damage step in either player's turn, when a face-up earth normal monster you control attacks or is attacked, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard, that monster gains 1000 attack and defense until the end phase. Again with the normal monsters! Listen, I know this archetype has at least 5 of them, and I say at least for reasons I'll get into soon, but using them as beaters isn't so much a central focus as it is a last resort option. To add rock salt into the wound, being a spellcaster type makes Merchant incompatible with any Gem Knight fusion monster. I have no interest in what this Merchant wants to offer me. You can't handle my strongest potions. You better go to a cellar that sells weaker potions. Their last level 3 monster is Gem Knight Obsidian. He's got 1500 attack and 1200 defense, and if this card is sent from the hand to the graveyard, you can target one level 4 or lower normal monster in your graveyard, special summon that target. It's a more specific cost than Lazuli, but the payoff is way better. Not only do you retrieve a normal monster when using this card from your hand as a fusion material, but you can also trigger the effect by discarding it with Offrey Scorpio, a card which is very welcome in the deck. You never want to go with less than 3 of Balls of Steel Iron Tarkus over here. Their first level 4 is a Gem Turtle with 0 attack and 2000 defense, and a flip effect saying, you can add 1 Gem Knight Fusion from your deck to your hand. Gem Knight Fusion, as you may imagine, is their basic archetypal fusion spell, so while this card may have served a decent purpose 8 years ago, it's essentially a joke at this point. There are cards that do much more for much less effort. I do like turtles a lot though, so uh, bonus points for that. Okay, so remember how I said Gem 
Gemini's have at least 5 normal monsters? Well, technically they have 3 more, because you're about to pay a visit back into the beloved Gemini mechanic. Gemini Tylite is an Aqua type with 1300 attack and 2000 defense, Gemini Tambor is a Thunder type with 1600 attack and 1400 defense, and Gemini Sardonyx is a Pyro type with 1800 attack and 900 defense. All being Gemini monsters, they have that charming clause where they have to be normal summoned twice to gain an effect and are treated as normal monsters in the hand or graveyard. The effects they gain are the following. Iolite once per turn lets you banish one gem monster from your graveyard to target one gem knight card in your graveyard, add that target to your hand. Amber once per turn lets you send one gem knight card from your hand to the graveyard to target one of your banished monsters and add that target to your hand, and when Sardonyx destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can add one gem knight card from your deck to your hand. Now, if after hearing all this you had a quirky idea for a gem knight deck using Catalyst Field to facilitate the Gemini monster's effects, please do take my word on this. It's not worth it. These effects would be okay in a theoretical situation where these are not Gemini monsters, but they're not nearly good enough as to warrant building your deck around them. The most relevant any of these ever had is Amber being ran in Thunder Dragon variants as a tech option and absolutely not due to its effect. This does make me wonder though, given that the Japanese name for the Gemini subtype is Duel, the OCG either wanted to make a really bad pun associating the archetype name with the English name the Gemini mechanic at the immense cost of playability, or they just genuinely thought including several Gemini monsters in the archetype would make for a solid gameplay style. And frankly, I don't know which is worse. Next up we have Gem Armadillo, which is a bit of a bizarre animal choice, but whatever, and it's got 1700 attack and 500 defense. When this card is normal summoned, you can add one Gem Knight monster from your deck to your hand. It's not the best thing to use your normal summon on in this deck, but it's pretty high up there. It can fetch you a valuable combo piece and act as a tolerable beater, so run any amount by your preference. Gem Knight Emerald has 1800 attack and 800 defense, and you can manage this face-up card you control and one face-up normal monster you control to target one Gem Knight Fusion monster in your graveyard, special summon it from the graveyard. Theoretically, it could be a decent recovery option, but the cost is generally way too high for the card to be actively ran. This one will most likely not save you any games, so don't bother. Their last main deck monster is Gemini Alexandrite, a level 4 with 1800 attack and 1200 defense, and you can tribute this card to special summon one Gemini normal monster from your deck. As a normal summon, it's a lot better than it seems at first due to giving you access to any vanilla you might need for a fusion, as well as setting up the graveyard. It's not ideal, you'll want to play Armadillo over it 99% of the time, even if you're talking potential targets for Block Dragon. Oh yeah, by the way, Block Dragon is really important and you wanna run that one. You can play one of these if you want to, but it's really not recommended. Their first fusion monster is the level 5 fairy, Gem Knight Seraphinite. She's got 2300 attack and 1400 defense, requires one Gem Knight monster and one light monster, and must be fusion summoned with the stated monsters, so no instant fusion, which is shared by all Gem Knight fusion monsters. During your main phase, you can normal summon or set one monster in addition to your normal summon or set, and you can only gain this effect once per turn. There's actually quite a bit to unpack here, so let's try and sum it up. First of all, yes. Yes, the card requires a light monster for the fusion summon, which Gemini's didn't even have until 3 years after Seraphinite came out in the form of Crystal Rose. So naturally people would be using different generic light monsters with some graveyard effects to facilitate the summon, however this condition would only become a huge deal once a certain fusion spell of theirs came out, that being Brilliant Fusion. Let's diverge for a second and talk about Brilliant Fusion because the context is massively necessary. It's a continuous spell that says when this card is activated, fusion summon one Gemini fusion monster from your exodus deck, using monsters from your deck as fusion materials, but change its attack and defense to zero. If this card leaves the field, destroy that monster. Once per turn, you can discard one spell, the monster special summoned by this card's effect gains attack and defense equal to its original attack and defense until the end of your opponent's turn. You can only activate one brilliant fusion per turn. At the time, this was the closest thing we had to an unlimited pre-errata future fusion, which instantly got people to rush and try breaking it as hard as humanly possible. Given that summoning Seraphinite with it not only gave you an additional normal summon, but also a free monster, three copies of brilliant fusion along with one Seraphinite and one Garnet, ended up being a centerpiece engine in any deck that could benefit from an additional normal summon or sending a light monster to the graveyard. Which was... a lot of decks. <laughs> like, Jesus Christ, did they intend for this to happen? Why specifically Garnet though? Because it's the generic main deck Gem Knight monster with the highest attack that you can also normal summon without tribute, which generally made it an objectively better choice to use as material than any of the other ones. In fact, Garnet became so popular as a brilliant fusion target that cards you would prefer not to be in your hand and instead stay in the deck to to certain interactions ended up being referred to by players as Garnets. The attack and defense reduction is pretty much irrelevant, given that you'll probably just be using the monster you summon as a combo piece, although it's not hard to get it back up for the beatdown variant. As for Seraphinite, as you would expect, the double summon effect is really good stuff, whether you're trying to extend a combo or... 
Play the Geminis. You'd usually want to run 3 Brilliant Fusion, but given that it's limited, you run 1 copy of both of these. Getting to Brilliant Fusion is a lot easier with the Predator Plant engine. Their other level 5 is Geminite Lady Lapis Lazuli. She's got 2400 attack and 1000 defense, requires 1 Geminite Lapis and 1 other Geminite monster, and you can only special summon her once per turn. Once per turn, you can send 1 Geminite monster from your main deck or extra deck to the graveyard, and if you do, inflict 500 damage to your opponent for each special summoned monster in the field. Damn, that's a lot of burn damage. Thankfully, both the effect and the summon are once per turn, so there should be no FTK shenanigans here. <laughs> Since we live in Hellworld, Lapis Lazuli is a notorious FTK enabler due to the amount of simple combos you can pull off to get 8000 plus burn damage per turn. You may ask how that works, given that there's a clear once per turn limitation here. Well, Konami was kind enough to give one of their main boss monsters the ability to copy other Geminite effects, and since they slipped up and made Lapis Lazuli's burn effect a soft once per turn, said boss monster can dispense that shit out like candy on Halloween. Not to mention she lets you dump a Geminite from the main and the extra deck, which is not only integral to the FTK, but also allows for some ridiculous graveyard setup. You run at least two Lapis Lazulis regardless of whether you're playing the FTK or OTK, cause this deck loves to kill in one turn, whichever turn it may be. Thankfully, we're done with the FTK enablers for a while, and we move on to their first level 6 and the first fusion counterpart for the Aqua types, Gemnite Aquamarine. It's got 1400 attack and 2600 defense, requires Gemnite Sapphire and one Gemnite monster, and if this card attacks, it is changed to defense position at the end of the battle phase. When this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, target one card your opponent controls, return that target to the hand. Okay, maybe they took a bit too much inspiration from early elemental heroes, because this feels like something that would appear once in a GX filler episode and then never show up again. The best thing about the card is the floating effect, and even that requires you to put it onto the field in the first place, so you might as well just run compulsory at that point. The level 6 thunder type fusion is Gemini Topaz, which has 1800 attack and defense, requires Gemini Tourmaline and one Gemini monster, and this card can attack twice during each battle phase. When this card destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the destroyed monster in the graveyard. Despite having mediocre stats for a level 6, Topaz can deliver a good beating due to attacking twice and dealing burst damage. Yeah, I call Flame Wing Man's effect burst damage because it sounds cool, just try and fucking stop me. Naturally, it doesn't help out with the FTK or anything, but it was an immensely satisfying card to use in the beatdown builds, and basically does the same thing nowadays. Run one if you feel like it. The last level 6, being the Pyro-type counterpart, is Gemnite Ruby. He's got 2500 attack and 1300 defense, requires Garnet and any other Gemnite monster, and once per turn you can tribute one face-up gem monster. This card gains attack equal to the tributed monster's attack on the field until the end phase. If this card attacks a defense position monster, inflict piercing damage to your opponent. The cost is a tad steep, but Ruby has the potential to become a gigantic beater with up to 1500 base attack. Naturally, if you already have an established board, this effect doesn't count for much, but it can help you get over big beaters, and if you happen to be running the Aqua type fusions, the tribute can trigger their floating effects. The piercing damage is also a nice addition despite falling out of style lately. This one is worth running for the beatdown as much as Topaz. The other Aqua counterpart in their first level 7 fusion is Gemnite Amethyst. It's got 1950 attack and 2450 defense, requires one Gemnite monster and one Aqua type monster, and when this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, return all set spell and trap cards on the field to the hand. Someone in the design team seems to have really had a bad grudge against the Aqua type Gemnites because they're consistently the worst of the bunch. Several years ago, when people actively ran battle traps, this might have had a faint bit of relevance, but today chances are that the back row is gonna be face up and activated way before you get that floating effect off. The mediocre stats and lack of an on-field effect make this one a bust. The thunder type level 7 fusion is Gemini Prismora. It's got 2450 attack and 1400 defense, requires one Gemini and one thunder type monster, and once per turn you can send one Gemini card from your hand to the graveyard to target one face up card on the field, destroy that target. You run one of these on the basis of it being very simple removal. Sure, it doesn't directly support any combos, but the cost is easy to pull off and some of the stuff you this card may have a solid floating effect. It's overall a nice monster without any noteworthy downsides, so it's cool to have it around. Their last level 7 is the Pyro-type Gemnite Citrine. With 2200 attack and 1950 defense, it requires one Gemnite and one Pyro-type monster, and if this card attacks or is attacked, your opponent cannot activate cards or effects until the end of the damage step. It's just an Armadis with mediocre stats, which used to be fine several years ago, but over time there's been less and less decks that actively employ battle traps or even care about battle phase floating. What used to be impressive in this regard is now just subpar, so Citrine is generally not recommended, but if you have a free spot in a beatdown build, this one doesn't tend to hurt. Their level 8 is Gemnite Zirconia, which requires a fusion of any Gemnite monster and a rock type monster, and has 2900 attack and 2500 defense and no effect. Damn boy, he's thick! 
This may not look like much aside from a fat beater, but that's actually perfectly fine. Most of your monsters are rock types, so it's astoundingly easy to summon, and makes for a nice interaction with Brilliant Fusion by letting you instantly dump a block dragon from the deck. 2900 attack is sure to beat over a lot of monsters, so Zirconia is good stuff even when Fusion summoned the classic way. All of this makes it a very valuable monster, so it's recommended that you run one or two of these. And now the fun is over, because we're moving back to the FTK enablers with a level 9 Gem Knight Master Diamond, their original boss monster. He's also got 2900 attack and 2500 defense, requires any 3 Gem Knight monsters and gains 100 attack for each gem monster in your graveyard. Once per turn you can banish one level 7 or lower Gem Knight Fusion monster from your graveyard, until the end phase, this card's name and original effect become the same as that banished monsters. Seemingly a tad underwhelming at first, Master Diamond is the reason why Gem Knights became as notorious as they are, and if you can believe it, it's not actually due to the attack boost effect. Jokes aside, you use this guy to copy the effect of Lapis Lazuli in the graveyard and usually burn for at least 2500 more damage, and even though he recently became limited, there's still a decent amount of combos that allow you to recycle him for repeated usage of this effect, even though the FTK itself became monumentally more inconsistent after the limiting of this card in Brilliant Fusion. Aside from that, he's cool to use in conjunction with the effects of cards like Ruby or Topaz due to the sheer battle damage output you get. You play the one copy you can, but in case he ever gets off the limited list, you immediately bump that shit up. Their final fusion monster is Gem Knight Lady Brilliant Diamond. She's a level 10 with 3400 attack and 2000 defense, requires 3 Gem Knight monsters, you can only special summon one of them per turn, and once per turn you can send one Gem Knight monster you control to the graveyard, and if you do, special summon one Gem Knight fusion monster from your extra deck, ignoring its summoning conditions. Now this one is truly outrageous. It turns any Gem Knight on your field into any fusion you might need at the moment, so it's a great card regardless of the build you're going for. In addition to the fantastic effect, she's got really impressive attack value, so it's super easy to put a lot of damage on board with this monster. Not much else to say here, just make sure to always run at least one of these. As for their only Xyz monster, we have Gem Knight Pearl, a rank 4 with 2600 attack and 1900 defense, requires 2 level 4 monsters and has no effect. I mean, for the time of its release, that being very early Xyz era, this used to be a tolerable rank 4 beater, but the only relevance it had since then was in decks that benefit from non-effect monsters being on the field, such as Infernoids or Phantasm Spiral, but we're not talking about those, so... Moving on. Their last monster is one of the best additions from the first Link Reigns pack, that being the Link 2 Gem Knight Phantom Quartz. He's got 1450 attack, bottom left and bottom right arrows, requires 2 gem monsters, and if this card is Link summoned, you can add 1 Gem Knight card from your deck to your hand. You can pay 1000 life points, fusion summon 1 Gem Knight fusion monster from your extra deck by shuffling fusion materials in your possession listed on it into your deck that are banished on your graveyard, but it cannot attack directly this turn. You can only use each effect of Gem Knight Phantom Quartz once per turn. It's when you compare something of this sort to the likes of Gladiator Beast Dragon is that you really start to wonder what kind of nepotism is going on over there at Konami HQ. Phantom Quartz is an absolutely ridiculous card that allows for unprecedented setup and combo extension for the deck, be it the searching ability or the parallel world fusion equivalent in the second effect. Fusion summoning a monster while recycling your resources would be a good thing by default, but this guy also has incredible interaction with Block Dragon, Crystal Rose and Master Diamond, simply due to turning the cost of those cards into more field presence. Pair it up with the great arrows and you have an all-around outstanding piece of support. Always play it, but not more than two is necessary. Moving on to their spells, we have the first archetypal fusion, aptly named Gem Knight Fusion. Fusion summon one Gem Knight Fusion monster from your extra deck, using monsters from your hand or your side with the field as fusion materials. If this card is in your graveyard, you can banish one Gem Knight monster from your graveyard, add this card to your hand. It's simple good stuff. The fusion effect is the most basic thing you can imagine, but the recovery stands out due to the card not being once per turn, making it a good target for things like Prismora's discard effect, as well as facilitating interaction with Phantom Quartz. Run one or two of these. Next up is Absorb Fusion, which lets you add one Gem Knight card from your deck to your hand, then you can apply this effect. Fusion summon one Gem Knight Fusion monster from your extra deck by banishing fusion materials listed on it from your hand or side of the field. You can only activate one Absorb Fusion per turn. You can also special summon monsters the turn you activate this card except Gem Knight monsters. It's a bit of a bizarre searcher given that it's also a fusion spell, but this would theoretically be fine if it didn't lock you into Gem Knights. The restriction is not as big of a deal in the beatdown variant, but if your deck is focusing on plays that are even remotely varied, this card is not recommended. If all you're going for is Gem Knights, it's a decent card to run since the deck struggles with consistency. Their final spell is Particle Fusion, yes all of their spells are fusions because they really needed to hammer that point home, and it lets you send from your side of the field to the graveyard the fusion material monsters that are listed on a Gem Knight fusion monster card, then special summon that fusion monster from your extra deck. The special summon is treated as a fusion summon. When you do, banish this card from the graveyard to target one Gem Knight fusion material monster used for the fusion summon, the fusion summon monster gains that monster's attack until the end phase. Yeah, okay, this one is bad, but I kinda like it, mainly because I'm a sucker for anything that supports this archetype's OT 
TK potential. If you're crazy enough, you can use one of the high level monsters as material for Topaz, turning it into a monster that can kill the opponent in two hits. The cost is high and it doesn't support any combos, but if you can find space for it in a beatdown focus build, I would recommend it. But wait, it doesn't stop there! Their first trap is also a fusion card, that being Pyroxene Fusion. Send from your hand or your side of the field to the graveyard the fusion material monsters that are listed on a Gemini fusion monster card, then special summon that fusion monster from your deck. This special summon is rated as a fusion summon. It's Gemini Fusion, but it's a trap card and has no recovery. None of your fusions have quick effects either, so... Why they print this? Was there not enough fusing going on? Well, apparently not, because it doesn't stop there either. Fragment Fusion is a trap card that lets you banish from your graveyard a fusion material monster that are listed on a Gem Knight fusion monster card, then special summon that fusion monster from your deck. Blah blah, it's a fusion summon, destroyed during the end phase. Not quite the miracle fusion equivalent they were going for, in fact, it's pretty freaking bad. I cannot imagine a scenario in which this would conceivably be a better card to use than any of the other ones you've got. The fact that Brilliant Fusion came out several years after all of these kinda seems like an apology in retrospect. Finally, for their first non-fusion piece of back row, we have Gem Enhancement. <laughs> Tribute one Gem Knight monster, then target one Gem Knight monster in your graveyard, special summon that target from the graveyard. Or you could do none of that and just run Monster Reborn, how handy! For their final card we have Brilliant Spark. If a Gem Knight monster you control is destroyed by battle with an opponent's attacking monster or by an opponent's card effect, target one of those monsters, inflict damage to your opponent equal to that monster's original attack. If this card is in your graveyard, you can send one Gem Knight card from your hand to the graveyard, add this card to your hand. You can only activate one Brilliant Spark per turn. It's your choice, friend. Will you opt for a burn damage via a somewhat inconsistent FTK that takes advantage of the archetype's best features, or an unreliable, slowly recurring trap card. Ideally, you'd say no to both of these, but especially to the latter. Let's see if there's any gems on the grading scale. The consistency has become a lot worse since the limiting of Brilliant Fusion, and even though there's a significant lack of archetypal searchers, you open up well enough for a basic play more often than you brick, and the FTK has a good amount of 3 card combos to kickstart itself. The power output is... Technically a 6 if we're looking at it from the FTK perspective, but regular Gem Knights aren't really a slouch in the damage department either. The fusions are pretty easy to access and have commendable stats, along with effects that provide more power on board and even some removal. It's somewhere between 3 and 4, but leaning closer to a 3 due to problems in setting up a field for beatdown. The recovery is also pretty decent, mainly due to the recursion from Lazuli and Obsidian, the recycling from Phantom Quartz, as well as Block Dragon's floating effect. They can't always come back from a broken play, but they definitely have the option. They have absolutely no protection, which tends to be the case with aggressive decks like this one. The point of versatility though is pretty hard to approach since, again, the deck is able to FTK, which is kind of a big deal, but setting that aside, while Gem Knights don't have many ways to approach their own deck building, they do excel at being supremely splashable due to the existence of Brilliant Fusion in combination with their various types in Seraphonite. The FTK itself somehow managed to pull through to this very day, so that has to account for something. I'm gonna give this a 4, but only for the very unorthodox reasons of splashability and FTK potential. In any other case, it's a 2, since all that left here is an archaic beatdown deck. Here's the recently topping FTK build from Kevin Rodriguez, including all the extra deck tools that assist in recycling Master Diamond, and there's a link to a compendium of TCG legal FTK combos at the bottom of the video description. And here's the OTK build, with which you should not expect to get any consistent victories. What a weird timeline of events for an archetype's life cycle. From a tolerable aggro deck, to a combo engine, to an FTK, to a worse FTK. Despite their link monster essentially fixing most of the deck's problems, their inherent intended playstyle was just too slow and lacking in versatility to ever become truly represented in modern variants, so naturally people had to settle for the best alternative available. Kind of a shame that it ended up like this, cause I feel like the basis of their playstyle was definitely something you could modernize with a short new wave of support. Not to say that they particularly have a chance of getting one, but I wouldn't mind seeing some new pieces of back row, main deck monsters with more active effects, and possibly a couple new fusions. There's a solid core here, part than my pun, but it needs some more refinement for the archetype's true playstyle to be crystal clear. Pardon my other pun. The image of the beauteous maiden fades into sparkling light. You were so mesmerized by her long, curled blue locks and tasteful goggles that you did not realize she was, in fact, just a beautiful illusion. An illusion of something you will never obtain, because you've never spent a single cent on snacks for the group, despite being in this game for four months running. So? Did I survive the poison or not? Oh. No, that killed you. I think I'm finally beginning to see the funny side. <laughs> this will be the tenth time you've checked for traps. In this room! <laughs> don't look at me. I don't have anywhere better to be. 
Anyway, roll four. Where are the dice? What, just because I'm a clown, you think I took them? I can't believe you! I thought we were living in a different time! Settle down, I'm just trying to... What's that noise? How's that for initiative? How'd you get in here? 